Amen. Well, it is so good to see you this morning. We are pleading for the fifth, pleading for the fifth today. Now, I've heard that said in a courtroom where uh, someone said, I plead the Fifth Amendment saying that I am not going to uh, say anything that would maybe uh, incriminate myself. So I'm pleading for silence, but that's not what we're doing today. We're pleading for the Fifth Commandment, where the Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, if you'll turn over there in verse number 12, Exodus chapter 20, the Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord hath given thee. Honor thy father and thy mother. Now, sometimes we may not know exactly what that looks like, so it, through the inspiration of Scripture, Paul put it down in the New Testament, just broke it down to where we would really understand it. And we find that in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 1, because the Bible says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 2, then it follows up with honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. There is a promise that goes along with that. It says that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest live long upon the earth. And then it goes on to talk to us fathers and it says, hey, don't provoke your children uh, to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. So uh, the offering's over. So you know, I'm not trying to get your pocketbook or anything else. You don't have to guard your purses, but I want everybody out here for just a minute, close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes, just right where you're at. You don't have to bow your heads, but just, just close your eyes. And I, I want you mentally to take just a moment and do something for me. I want you to picture in your mind the face of your mother. Just picture the face of your mother. In your mind right now, I want you to think about your mom. Now I want you to take another step and I want you to think about your dad. In your mind, just think about your mom and your dad. See their faces in your mind. And then finally, if you have children, if you're a parent, think about your kids. And in your mind, answer this question, do they honor me? And then, and then answer this question, do I honor my parents? Now, now look up here at me. In some of your minds, you just felt severe anger. In some of your minds, you smiled, you laughed, because it, you, you, you have great memories of mom and dad. But you see, that's not everybody's memory. There's some of you here who may have been abused by a parent, may have been uh, molested by a, a, a step-parent or, or a parent in your life. Maybe you were hit physically. Maybe you were emotionally, verbally abused. You understand the complexity that I'm dealing with here today. Not everybody's memory of their parents are good memories. You, you understand that? Not everybody's relationship with mom and dad is like some of us who we can just think back. I got to call my dad yesterday and just say, thank you for the Christian raising. Thank you for my Christian upbringing. Thank you for being great parents. But not everybody got that. In fact, some of your parents still, they don't like the fact that you go to church and they don't like the fact that you're a Christian and they don't like all this stuff that you're doing, all this God thing. They think you've gone overboard and they're against that. You understand the complexity and all of the different things and the emotions that go into this conversation. But here's what I want you to understand. The Bible says, Honor thy father and thy mother, and there's no fine print, there's no exception clauses. The Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land. He says that to everybody, whether you had good parents or bad parents, the commandment still applies. So when you think of it in that regard, there's a lot of things that we've got to talk about today, and I want to help you. So we, uh, on our vacation, will you bring that picture up, Jody, uh, the picture I sent you to load, or Brother Shannon? So that is my smoking hot wife with a giant hog that she killed in front of her. And uh, you say, what does that have to do with the sermon? Nothing really. It's just a giant hog and my really hot wife who shot that giant hog while we were in Florida. And, um, and so coming soon, that hog will be mounted on the wall and uh, you can come by our house and see it. But anyhow, uh, back, to the, back to the slides. So <clears throat> we went to Florida on vacation and we spent far, part of our vacation hog hunting. So um, that was like my, and everybody killed the hog except for me because after that hog, there was no me shooting a hog that wasn't bigger than her hog. And I don't think there's any woods in Florida that have a bigger hog than that. And uh, so that was a stinking giant hog for a wild boar. Now, stay with me. <clears throat> But when we were there, there's alligators in, the, in all the ponds that are around there and in the river. In fact, they have alligator hunts that you can go on and hog, I mean, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's a rough part of, I mean, South Florida swamps. There's about 20,000 acres on this ranch and, uh, and just no fences, just, I mean, you're right there. You, I mean, there's giant rattlesnakes. There's everything you can imagine. You can hear the coyotes yipping at night. And so when we would go out at night, especially Mater, and he didn't know exactly where we were going. When we would go out in the evenings or it started getting dark, Mater and Kenzie started getting closer to me. 
In fact, when it came time to walk out of the woods, like Mater's like holding my hand. Because it was an uncertainty for him. It was an uncertain place and he didn't know exactly where he was going and he was a little bit afraid. And so can I just say today, if you have those feelings towards your parents and you're a little bit bitter, you're a little bit angry, you're a little bit hurt, you're not in good relationship, will you just take my hand today spiritually and let me help you walk through some things where we can have a right relationship with mom and dad? Today, the Lord's allowed me to be in a place sort of as your spiritual father, as a spiritual leader, and spiritually, I want to walk you through to a place to where we can be more in touch with the Lord and we can obey this fifth commandment. I remember watching a kid who graduated from Christian school from a single parent home and the mother worked two jobs so that her child could be in Christian school. And when he graduated, he took the diploma. I was preaching the graduation. He took the diploma and he knelt down before his mom, Pastor Luke, and he gave his mom the diploma and he said, you earned this, you worked, you slaved, you sacrificed, you paid for me to go, you helped me do my homework, you encouraged me, you loved me, you didn't let me quit. And, and he gave her the diploma, but sad to say that's not the appreciation that most kids give their parents this is so important this commandment that after no other gods before me no graven images don't take the lord's gods thy name in vain this is more important than murder this is more important than adultery you understand, this commandment came before all those others. Why? Because if this commandment is done right and the parents raised them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, it'll take care of murder. It'll take care of adultery. It'll take care of bearing false witness. It'll take care of stealing. It'll take care of covetousness because we got to get this commandment right between mom and dad and us. The family unit is the just the, the, the basic, I mean, it is just the most basic principle. In fact, before the church was even founded, the family was put together. Now, I've heard some preachers use this, and in fact, I, I worked with a pastor for a while, so his thing was, before the church was the family, so family came before God and everything. That's, that's, that's taking it to an extreme. You understand that we're to love the Lord our God first, right? God first. Then, then when we have that relationship right with God, then the family relationship works. But I mean, God put this commandment, the horizontal commandments, when we start dealing with men, right after the vertical with God, he said, now honor your father and your mother. This is important. This is fundamental to any proper family relationship. And this is the building block of society. And Satan and Hollywood are trying to tear this down. Hey guys, if you don't put me a clock on the back wall, I'm probably gonna preach till like 1230. So I've got so much good stuff. So throw me 20 minutes up there. Let's say I used five. And if y'all will give me whatever I went over that five, then, uh, then I'll, I'll try to get done uh, on time. But, but I, I want you to think about something to this fundamental thought. This week, God gave me something I'd never seen before. Luke chapter nine and verse number 58. You don't have to read it, but here's what Jesus said. Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the son of man hath no place to lay his head. In other words, he had no place to call home. He had no shelter. Now, what happens when, when, when you begin to pursue a wild animal? Maybe a, a storm comes up and begins to beat. Uh, the storms that you guys had on Friday and Saturday that, that blew in here and the hail came. The birds went to their nest because it was a place of safety. Home was safe. The fox goes down in the, the den and burrows up when the storms come, when the hunters pursue, when, when they are afraid because they go to a safe place that's home. In fact, the VA, I, I, I was a, a foreign wars veteran and I have, have served overseas. And when I go to the VA for whatever it is, if it's to do an x-ray to see if the shrapnel's moved or, or if I go in for uh, whatever the exams are, the first thing they tell you at the VA is, do you feel safe at home? Question number one, do you feel safe at home? Why? Because they know if home is a safe place, then you can make it through the hard times. But when there's no rest at home, and see, Jesus said, I have nowhere to lay my head because this world is not my home. My home is in heaven, and I have no safe place here on earth. Now, I just want to ask you something. I know our lives are not perfect, but is your home safe? Spiritually, physically, emotionally, is your home safe? Do your kids have a safe place to go? You say, well, I, I just don't know how I could do that. I, do you know what? I don't care about what your past was, but can I tell you this? God can build you a future. And you know what's amazing? What does a bird build a nest with? Broken sticks, broken twigs, 
and things of no value. Can I say this? Your life may be broken. Your kid's lives may be broken. Your spouse's life may be broken, but God can still put together a safe home for you. He built, the foxes have dens. They burrow into the dirt, something that we consider worth nothing. He, He can take something that is worth nothing and make something valuable out of it and build a safe harbor for you. But it starts with honoring our fathers and our mothers. And can I say something to our teenagers and young people that are here today? And and it's not just the teenagers, young people, but especially you. If you are not right with mom and dad, you are not right with God. I I can't believe not one parent amened me there. So shame on you parents if you don't get that. You must be right with your parents. If you are in rebellion against your parents, you are not right with God. In fact, the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It's like taking Ouija boards and Dungeons and Dragons and and having seances and putting out the candles and putting out the pentagrams and and listening to the heavy metal satanic music and worshiping Satan. That is what rebellion is like. And some of you are not right with your parents. And so therefore you're not right with God. Amen, Brother Mark. That's good preaching. So first of all, there must be a respect that is demanded. <clears throat> Let me give you this very quickly. I, once I put this picture up there, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure. I, I think maybe that's the dad down on the end with the mustache, but that's a really dumb looking mustache. And uh, that looks, I mean, only Brother Luke could probably pull that off and make it look good. But, um, <clears throat> but there must be a respect that is demanded. There's an elevation to recognize. In the army, we have this thing called salute the uniform. And that's, Nate, when you have an officer who may be a dirtbag, really, he's lazy, he doesn't work hard, he doesn't do his job, he doesn't stay late, he doesn't do those things, and you're supposed to salute him, sometimes you're not saluting him because he's worthy of your salute, sometimes you're saluting him because that's his position. You're saluting the uniform. Let me just say this, kids, your parents do not have to be perfect because, by the way, you're not perfect. So you say, well, I don't have to obey my parents because they don't go to church as much as me. Shut your mouth and obey them and honor them. Unless they are telling you to go against the word of God, honor your parents. And even then you still honor, you just can't obey if they're asking you to go diametrically opposed to the things of God. Honor your parents. This is the first commandment with promise. You have been given a promise here. And I think this, that, that, that the promise for long life for me was the fact that I did not rebel because my dad would have killed me. But for some of you, that may not be the case, but honor is to be given anyway. Number two, there's an esteem to render as we grow older and we move out on our own and we leave and we cleave and we follow after our mate as the Bible has told us to do, there is still an esteem to be rendered. Can I just say this, that Jesus, when he was 12 years old, he honored his mom and dad when he was in the temple. He obeyed them, he followed them. We see that example as a teenage boy, but can I take it a step further? When Jesus was hanging on the cross in Luke chapter number 19 and verse number 22, he looked at, at, at John and said, John, behold thy mother and, 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 and Mary, his mother, he said, Behold, he was still looking and honoring his mother, even on the cross. He was still looking out for mom and dad. There's an esteem that we must render, there's also an experience that we must regard. Parents speak from a view of experience. I heard about a little girl who was praying one day, and, and she said, This, please, Lord, don't give my mommy any more children because she do not know how to treat the ones she already has. My parents got so smart from about the time I was 18 years old and I left home, I thought my parents were idiots. God had only given me my parents to take away all my fun. And by the time I reached 25 years old in seven years, my parents, I mean, they got really smart in seven years. I don't know what they learned in those seven years, but all of a sudden they got to be some of the smartest people I'd ever met. They speak from a position of experience. So let, let, me, let me give you an example. So have you ever carpooled with somebody and maybe you were two or three hours ahead of them and they were coming behind you? And, and so I've had this happen before and all of a sudden that person in front of me says, hey, watch out, there's a traffic jam at so-and-so, you need to go around it. They're warning me about a problem. And maybe they, get, they stop for a hotel that night and they say, hey, we stopped at the Holiday Inn Express at this exit and man, it's clean. There's a very nice restaurant next door. If you'll stop here, you're gonna have everything at your fingertips. This is a good, safe place for you to be. You know what? They're not smarter than me they've just been further down the road your parents have been further down the road than you they've experienced all those things they've seen the mistakes they went through the fads they lived through all those things and they've come out on the other side and they have the experience to prove it and I want you to know that your parents have experience that you need to honor 
It's very important because some of you are gonna learn the hard way if you don't listen to mom and dad. Number two, very quickly, there's a respect that is deserved. Now, now uh, I know that primarily this is to young people and this is to, to children, to parents, but parents, we also have a responsibility to raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. In fact, fathers are to provoke not their children to wrath, but to raise them. And if you don't have a dad in the home, mom, you are to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, you know, if I force my kids to go to church, they'll hate church. Well, you force them to brush their teeth and you force them to take baths. What if they grow up hating baths? You say, oh, well, it's different, it's God. Yeah, that's the problem with a lot of us is we think God's not near as important. Isn't it amazing that we'll never be late for work, but we can't get to church on time? Amen, Brother Mark, that's good preaching. What did you just teach your kids? Well, work's really important, but, you know, church, if you can do it, you just get there when you can. Man, I'm, man, I'm on it today. How do we teach them that? By, their, by, by, by our faithfulness. Parents know this, that kids respect a faithful life, not a perfect life, but a faithful life. And kids love it when they know that their parents have their best interests at heart. Are we faithful to God? Church, can, can I give you guys some examples? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna hurry. I know I've got like 11 minutes left, so I'm, I'm hurrying. And, and I wanna bring this to a close because I really wanna help you today. It's so important for us to understand. When I grew up, we went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, training union, soul winning. In fact, there was this famous saying that used to go, it takes three to thrive, three to thrive. You gotta go to church three times a week, three to thrive, three to thrive. And, and as society has gone on, we have less church and, and uh, we, we do less things. And, uh, and now, now it's more like we have Sunday morning and then we have Wednesday night and, and Sunday night is becoming less and less um, popular and less and less even attended or done. Um, and then we have Sunday school and, and sometimes we'll have like, like last week we had like 750 at church and we only had like 200 at Sunday school. And, um, but here's what happens. Kids never, it seems like, surrender any more than their parents. They always stop a little short. Mom and dad, if you only come to church one time a month, your kids probably aren't even going to go. And if you never make Wednesday night or Sunday nights, we don't have Sunday nights, but once a month. And then we have outreach. If you don't make that important, your kids are never going to make that important. You say, well, I thought this was about kids. Well, it's about you too, because if you'll set a better example, your kids will do more. Last year when I came in off vacation, I preached just do it and y'all loved it. And you're not as excited about this one today. <laughs> you know, what you do is louder than what you say. Uh, let's move on. You guys didn't like that one very much. Uh, let's go to buyer fairness. There should be no favorites. There should be no favorites. There's two extremes that parents take. We either discipline, discipline, discipline. If you step out of line, we beat you. Or the other one is, we just give them so much liberty, we just let them go do their own thing and they'll just learn. Well, they might just learn and they come back with a, a STD. They might just learn if you don't put any rules on their life and they come back pregnant. Come on now. You might just let them learn to the point that they mess their life up and they end up with something that they can't take back and they find themselves in jail. We can't just be firm, but we have to be fair. We have to be tempered in love. I had this conversation with my kids. How many of you have ever gone on vacation before and you've got your kids in the back seat and sometimes you just want to turn around and go home because they get to fussing? Y'all ever have kids that do that? My kids do that sometimes. And y'all that didn't raise your hand, you're lying. And so, <clears throat> um, that happy, yeah, preacher's kids have fuss too. And so I looked at them this week, Nate, and I said, guys, I'm begging you. I don't want to whip you on vacation. Stop. I don't want to whip you when we're on vacation. Please, just be good till we get home. And I look at my wife and she goes, oh, they're just playing. My kids just play for about 15 minutes and then one of them pushes too hard, says something too mean, and then it turns into a fight. Again, I'm sure y'all's kids never do this, but mine do. And then you want to turn around and it's like, if I could grab one of you, I'm going to choke you right now. And you're like, drive it and grab it for a kid. Some of you are acting really holy right now that you've all done the same thing. 
Guarantee you that's happened on the Bonner bus a time or two. No, Charles is like, no, no. My kids just sit in the back and read their Bible and pray the whole trip. <laughs> now listen to me. We've got to be fair. We've got to be fair. Sometimes it's not fair to our kids when we say, well, I'm just not gonna do it this time. I, I, I apologize to my kids. Here was the apology I gave, Brother Gary. I said, guys, I'm sorry for not spanking you on vacation because I should have been more consistent and fair. And they're like, it's okay, Dad, we forgive you. <laughs> Number three, by our fruitfulness. Parents are loved when kids see them investing in their lives. When we give them in so love and so respect so kindness, then that's what we're gonna reap. There was this boy that came to his pastor. He was real concerned. He said, preacher, I'm really concerned about my parents. He said, what's going on? He said, my dad is working his fingers to the bone. He has me in Christian school. He's, he's given me a great home. He, he's doing everything he can to provide for me. My mom is, is, is literally slaving, keeping my clothes clean and cooking the best meals. The, the pastor looked at him. He said, son, what are you concerned about? He's like, I'm afraid they're gonna escape. I'm pretty blessed. Be not deceived, God's not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. What did you sow with your parents? That's what you're gonna reap. And you're always gonna reap more than you sow and you're always gonna reap later than you sow and you're always gonna reap what you sow. You understand that principle? So if you were a hellion, don't be surprised if your kids are hellions. You're reaping what you sow. But you should know how to deal with it. That's why, because I was a boy and we were at the beach and all of a sudden I look at my daughter and I'm like, she's really pretty. And any boys that like started playing football and got closer and closer to our tent, I walked out and explained to them to go away. There's other parts of the beach they can play on. <laughs> because I was a boy and I know. And you say, well, I mean, what were you thinking? I'm thinking I've got a gun in the truck, sand is soft, you can shovel easy and we can take care of this. <laughs> and I can throw whatever's left over to the hogs that I'm hunting. You shoot, you shovel, and you shut up. <laughs> because I was there. I want my kids to produce fruit. I want them to produce spiritual fruit. I want them to love the Lord. And, and can I say this? I, I told this quickly, in, in, and, and I've got five minutes to finish, but I told this quickly in our, in our Sunday school lesson today. I have parents bring their kids to me or their grandkids to me that are in rebellion, and they're really, I mean, they're cussing their mom and dad, they're slamming doors. They're, I, I'm, I'm living proof that I've never cussed my mom or my dad. I'm living proof that I never disrespected my mom or my dad because my dad would have killed me. That was not an option. I didn't have that option. But can I say this, most of the time when that happens and I sit that family down and I begin to talk to them and I look at the parents and I ask them, hey, have, have you ever, do, do, do you ever speak bad about me in front of your kids? Because a lot of times I know a lot about this family before they come in and I know that sometimes they have roast preacher out in the parking lot because I've even overheard it happening right here in that back parking lot. I've walked by and heard myself getting roasted after church and gone, hey guys, and walked right up in the group. Yeah. And then you wonder why your kids are rebellious? It's because you're rebellious. The way you talk about policemen, the way you talk about authority, the way you talk about, come on now. Hey Amen, Brother Mark. Boy, you're coming up my turnip patch today. They're just doing what you taught them. Don't be surprised when you taught them to be a rebel. You're gonna reap it. Some of you that have ate me alive, you're gonna reap it with your kids. They're gonna do the same thing to you and it's gonna hurt you so bad. You're gonna say, why are my kids doing this? Because you did it. Don't be deceived. God's not mocked. What you sowed, you'll reap and you'll reap more than you sowed. One grain of corn will produce thousands. Let's go to the last point. This is the good one. This is the good news. There's a reward to be delivered. Number one, by our days being lengthened. By our days being lengthened. I believe that this promise brings a literal 
blessing of God upon your life. But the, also, the opposite is also true. Um, <clears throat> I'll never forget hearing this story about a teenage girl. Her friends started drinking. She was in the car with them. And, and she said, take me home, take me home. I'm a Christian. I'm not gonna be a part of this. Take me home. I don't wanna be here. Take me home. And, and the kids began to make fun of her. And they said this. They said, are you afraid of your parents? Are you afraid that they're gonna hurt you? This has always stuck with me. Here's what they said. No, I'm afraid if I go do that, I'm gonna hurt them. That's honoring your father and your mother. I'm gonna hurt them. This truth is shown in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse number 17. It says, the eye that mocks God gets, and mocks the parents gets plucked out. God's got this under control. Your days will be lengthened, but your days will also be lightened. God blesses those who obey with a godly life. George Washington was about to go to sea. He had his trunk packed on the ship. He was walking up the gangplank, and his mom looked at him and said, George, with tears running down her face, please don't go. George Washington got his trunk off of the ship. His dream had always been to go to sea. He came off the ship. They asked him, why are you doing this? Your mom's just emotional right now. He said, I will not break the heart of my mother. She has told me that she doesn't want me to go. And look what God did with George Washington. He was not some sailor that sailed around on a ship, but he was the father of our country who's still making an impact today. God uses those who honor their parents. <clears throat> coach Campos, I can, I loved basketball. It was my dream. And my dad was my coach. So kind of like you and Braden, my dad, I mean, my dad called the University of Arkansas, called all these big schools to come and watch me play. And I mean, I, I'll never forget, Nolan Richardson was the coach and he had a scout there. And my, my dad told him, my dad's like, yeah, Mark's better than anybody you got on your team. Best shooter I've ever seen in my life. Have you ever seen the, the, the film where he went 11 straight three-pointers in a game? And I had a high game in, in, in high school where I scored 72 points. Once I hit 50, the rest of my team just said, we're gonna give the ball to Bishop, he's gonna break the record. I'm like, like they decided, I wasn't ball hogging. Like they would have a layup and turn around and throw it out to me so I could shoot a three. My team loved me and we loved each other. and They tried to help me break the state record. I wanted to go to a big school, Arkansas State University. That's where I wanted to go. I wanted to go be an Indian. Division I school. I had an opportunity to go there, walk on, red shirt a year, play the next year. Brother Mike was teasing me about dunking. I mean, there was a day when I could run down the middle of the lane and dunk on people. That day is not now. Just ask Brother Nate. He plays ball with me. Sometimes I get a good four or five inches lift on, on my good days. Now listen, my dad said this, son, I want you to play basketball. I know you love the game, but if you'll go to Pensacola Christian College for one year, you're gonna redshirt this year anyway. Go to Pensacola Christian College for one year. I'll, 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 I'll pay for your school. If you'll go for one year, I want you to get grounded in some things of your faith, then go play basketball. My dad did it in such a way that I, I didn't feel like he was telling me I couldn't go. I felt like he was encouraging me to go, but he just wanted me to do this other thing first. And I honored my father and my mother and I went. To Pensacola Christian College, NAI school, played ball there. <clears throat> I got there, and three of the most important things happened in my life. Number one, I got thoroughly right with God. Number two, I was called to preach. And number three, I met my wife. And I never left Pensacola Christian College because God put a different plan in my heart from that point on because I honored my father and my mother and their wishes, and I wouldn't take it back for anything in the world. Honor thy father and thy mother. Now, now stay with me and I'm done, I'm, I'm finished. I just wanna give you this thought to think about. In the summer of 1969, that's not a song. 49 years ago this past Friday on 20 July, Aldrin Armstrong and Collins landed on the moon. Armstrong took the first step on the moon and said, one small step for man, one giant step for mankind. And, and 10 years after that, they brought him in and they were interviewing Buzz Aldrin. And I read this this week. I read this this week. Here's what he said. They said, Mr. Aldrin, in 10 years, the whole space race has changed. Mr. Aldrin, what has changed in your life? And what impact did it make for you to go to the moon? Here's what he said. Get this, get this. 
He said, 10 years ago, they taught me how to walk on the moon. 10 years ago, they spent literally months, hours, days, years training me how to walk on the moon. But in the last 10 years, I found out that nobody ever taught me how to walk on earth. Mom and dad, we're to teach our kids how to walk on this earth, how to live for God, how to be surrendered. You say, how are my kids going to know how to tithe? Because mom and dad tithes. And when they get money for their birthday, we teach them how to do it. How are they going to know how to attend church? Because you bring them to church and you sit up front. How are we going to teach them to amen and how to praise and worship? Mama, grandma, grandpa, put your hands up. You teach them how to live on earth because this world is never going to teach them how to live for God. It's only going to be you. Will you teach your kids how to do that? Now, let, let me give you this. Some of you don't have a heavenly father. You know, the greatest way that you could honor God today would be give him your heart and give him your life and give him your future and give him your eternity. You know what? Some of you, you, you have been saved, but you've never surrendered your life to him to do whatever God wants. Some of you young men, God's calling you to preach. Maybe God's calling you to the mission field, just like Mike and Jen. One of these days, you're going to go to a foreign country and you're going to build churches and you're going to reach people for the gospel. Maybe God's calling you to missions today. And it don't have to be these young people. You know, God does call adults. I watched a testimony given last week, and, and, and can I say this nicely, by a former junkie. 5,000 views. People are commenting on it like crazy. Man, Nate, I'm so proud of you. God has changed your life. You know, God calls anybody from any background, anywhere. God can use you. But you won't honor him. It would be sad if you would honor your earthly father more than you would honor your heavenly father. The first four commandments say, get right with this dad. The fifth commandment says, get right with this dad. And until you get right with this dad, you'll never be right with this dad. And let me take it one step further. Until you get right with this dad, you'll never be right with this dad. Some of you need to send a text today. You need to make a phone call today. You need to write a letter today. You need to send a Facebook message today. Some of you need to get on Facebook and it's gonna look like it's Father's Day or Mother's Day because you're gonna tell your mom and dad how much you appreciate them publicly because you have not been honoring your parents like you should. That should happen. Adults, kids, we need to be right with mom and dad. And then we need to be right with God. Is that you? Do you have a right relationship with God? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Pastor Luke's going to come and he's going to sing a song in just a moment. But I'm going to ask two quick questions and then this service is over. Every head out, every eye closed. How many of you would say, Pastor Mark, I don't know that I'm in right relationship with God and I do not know that if I died today that I would even go to heaven. I'm not sure where I would spend eternity. Would you pray for me? No one's looking. I'm not going to come to you and I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. Preacher, I'm not sure where I'd even spend eternity if I were to die now. I'm not in right relationship with God, my heavenly father. Would you pray for me? If that's you, would you slip your hand up around the building? I'd like to pray for you. I see that hand. Thank you. Is there anyone else? I see that hand. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Anyone else? In just a moment, we're going to, I see that hand. Thank you. You can put them down. I see that hand. Thank you. In just a moment, we're going to give an old-fashioned invitation, which just simply means this. We're going to invite you to come to this, this altar down here at the front. You say, well, can, can I talk to God in my seat? You can. But there's something about that surrender where you just give up. You say, but, I, but what are people going to think? Most everybody here has taken the same walk you have, and they got down on this same altar right here, and they've done business with God. And I'm going to be standing right here at the front. And if you're not sure where you're going to spend eternity, I want you to come to me and let me or my wife or, or one of the men in our church or one of the ladies in our church, if it's a lady, let them take the word of God and show you how you can know where you're going to spend eternity. Get right with our Heavenly Father. But here's the second question and I'm done. How many of you right now, every head is bowed, every eye is closed, would just be honest and say, Pastor Mark, I'm not really right with my earthly mom and dad. And, and there's some things I probably need to get right. If the Lord were to return today and I were to stand before him, I would be embarrassed about the relationship with my parents. Pastor Mark, pray for me that I'll get right with my mom and my dad. I don't care what age you are, but God spoke to you about that. You felt that, that, that prick in your heart. You felt that. I need to be right with mom and dad. If that's you this morning, would you slip your hand up all around the building? All around the building. Hold them up. Let me pray for you. All around the building. Lots of hands. You can put them down. 
we must honor our father and our mother. Father God in heaven, please, I pray that you would take this time for us to do business with you and you would so imprint it upon our heart and then upon our mind that we would respond accordingly. Lord, if we need to get right, if we need to send a text, if we need to send a letter, if we need to make a phone call, if, if, if we need to uh, do those things, Lord, help us to do it today. Help us to properly honor mom and dad and then properly honor you. God, please. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Stand